Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this afternoon's program. It's just almost five o'clock. We will start the program about three or four minutes after five o'clock to allow everyone to get in. In the meantime, if you could please um, mute yourself so that you have optimal viewing and listening. Also, today's program will be recorded for the YouTube channel, Pasadena Library, so that you can uh, view it again and you can um, tell your friends to look at this very important program presented by Karen DeMulty on her book, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christine Reeder. It's my pleasure to be able to welcome you to this program sponsored by the Friends of the Pasadena Public Library. We are honored this afternoon to welcome Karen Tumulty to present her book, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. It is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful book. It's a gorgeous cover, a photo of Nancy Reagan. The book has extensive bibliography. There are more than extensive notes on each chapter, a comprehensive index, and a lot of very interesting photos. So the book is available in the Pasadena Public Library. You can put a hold on it and check it out um, curbside or go to your favorite branch and um, pick it up at this time. And you can also go to Roman's Bookstore and purchase a copy for your own collection. I'm sure you know the devastating news about our Pasadena Central Library being closed due to seismic retrofit. So we have opened up our branches for extensive hours um, to assist patrons in the Pasadena Public Library for their enjoyment of our libraries. And we are open for limited access service. Um, and so I hope that you will come and view and visit our libraries. So the book, as I said, is beautiful. Adored by some, Nancy Reagan was also abhorred by others. She stands among the nation's most influential first ladies. With style and sensibility, Washington Post columnist Karen Tumulty explains why and the triumph of Nancy Reagan. Hers was the power that came with intimacy. She had but one preoccupation, Ronald Reagan's well-being and success. Her goals included, but were not limited to, guarding his health, protecting his presidency and shaping his legacy. A staunch caregiver, she monitored his stamina, a shrewd reader of people. She made sure that self-serving or incompetent aides were weakened or dismissed. A steward of his career, she encouraged his work to hasten the end of the Cold War. But the author also writes, Reagan could be imperious and tone deaf and made many missteps, among them purchasing enormously expensive china and borrowing but keeping designer apparel. Prodigiously researched, as I said, the biography is comprehensive and perceptive. Enriched by the many interviews the multi conducted, including those with the couple's children, Patty Davis and Ron Reagan. Political junkies will revel in accounts of her role in five election campaigns as First Lady of California and the nation. Film fans will enjoy the stories of the couple's Hollywood careers and celebrity watchers will find numerous anecdotes concerning people as varied as 
Sam Donaldson, Betty Ford, and Donald Trump. The Reagans, a couple defined by mutual devotion, lived a love story that, had it been invented by a novelist, would have reeked of impossibility. But true to her reportorial roots, Malty writes with sympathetic but clear eye. She examines her subject's insecure childhood, her brittle but vulnerable nature, her dependence on prescription medication, and her steadfast commitment to her marriage vows as her husband disappeared into the fog of Alzheimer's disease. During his dreadful final decade, even her critics voiced admiration. As the author writes, for the acclaim and sympathy that finally came her way, Nancy paid the highest price imaginable. Theirs had been a monumental story and she was left to write the ending alone. Unlike Kitty Kelly's 1991 hatchet job, the triumph of Nancy Reagan is intimate and balanced a triumph and a definitive contribution to history for the author. So before I introduce Karen to you, I want to tell you a little bit about her. She is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin with a bachelor's of journalism and a graduate of Harvard Business School with a master's in business administration. She's a columnist for the Washington Post and her previous role as a national political correspondent for the newspaper, she received the Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. She joined the Toast, the Post, I'm sorry, the Post in 2010 from Time Magazine, where she held the same title. During her more than 15 years at Time, she wrote or co-wrote more than three dozen cover stories. She also held positions with time as congressional correspondent and White House correspondent. Before joining the time in 1994, she spent 14 years at the Los Angeles Times where she covered a wide variety of beats. During her time there, she reported on Congress, business, energy and economics from Los Angeles, New York and Washington, DC. She's a native of San Antonio where she began her career at the now defunct San Antonio Light. She's married and obviously lives in Washington, DC. She has received numerous honors and awards, the Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting in 2014, National Press Foundation, Edwin M. Hood Award for Diplomatic Correspondence, 1993, and the Gerald Loeb Award, 1982. And it gives me great pleasure and honor on behalf of the Friends of the Pasadena Public Library to welcome Karen Tumulty to speak about her wonderful book, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Um, are, are we okay here on the sound? Well, thank you so much. And the only thing that would make me happier is if I could actually be in California, where I spent so much wonderful time uh, working on this book. Um, I, I have worked on this book for four and a half years. Uh, this was not my idea to write a biography of Nancy Reagan. It was actually an idea that my publisher, Simon & Schuster, came to me with a few months after she died. Um, they basically said, we want a biography of Nancy Reagan. Do you want to write it? And I had never written a book before. I was a little afraid of the whole idea of whether I could write a book. So I decided to take the plunge. Um, I've been incredibly gratified by the reviews this book has gotten from everywhere from the New Yorker to the National Review on the right. Um, uh, but I think that what this book requires is for readers to do what I did. Uh, Nancy Reagan was a figure that I think the whole country made up their minds about 40 years ago, whether they liked her or they didn't. 
And I really had to sort of put aside what it was I thought I knew about her and just sort of go where the, where the facts led me. And she was an incredibly complicated person. Uh, she had her flaws, she had her demons, but what I, I realized was how incredibly influential she really was to the rise of one of the most consequential figures of the 20th century, to the success of the Reagan presidency. And I mean, in terms of shaping policy and ultimately, um, you know, when her husband, when she begins the slow loss of her husband to Alzheimer's disease, it really falls upon her shoulders to begin to sort of guide and shape Ronald Reagan's legacy. So about two years into the research, I realized that, you know, if, if I could pull off the kind of book that I wanted to write, that it would be not only a biography of a consequential first lady who was really overdue for a reassessment, but also it would be a whole new way, hopefully, of looking at, as I said, one of the most consequential figures of the 20th century, the entire Reagan presidency, and really a lot of the policies that have continued to shape politics, that have continued to shape you know, American life for more than a, a generation after Reagan left office. But um, First Lady is often been noted as a role that comes with no mandate. It comes with no job description. Every one of our First Ladies has had to, to kind of start from scratch, shape it for herself. But there is one thing that many of them have had to learn the hard way, which is that when the word powerful is applied to a first lady, it is very rarely intended as a compliment. But few of our first ladies, I think really had a rockier go of it than Nancy Reagan did. Uh, she was alternately scorned as some kind of pre-feminist throwback to, you know, who only cared about fashion and design. Um, but she was also portrayed as a calculating power behind the throne. Uh, these stereotypes wouldn't seem to, caricatures wouldn't seem to be able to coexist in one person, but they did. Uh, I, the various names that she was called along the way included the Iron Butterfly, Fancy Nancy, the Evita of Bel Air, Mommy Dearest, the Ice Queen, and my personal favorite, Attila the Hen. Um, when she and Ronald Reagan met in 1949, uh, it would have been impossible for anyone and especially the two of them to have imagined what really lay ahead for them. He showed up for their first date, literally a broken man. He was standing on two canes because he had just spent the previous six, six weeks to two months in traction because he had broken his leg in six places in a, in a charity baseball game. And spiritually, Ronald Reagan was in what he would later describe as a deep freeze. It was really the lowest point of his life. He was approaching middle age. His movie career, which was never really all that illustrious, was hitting bottom. His first wife, Jane Wyman, had gotten bored with him and just walked out of the marriage. And he, he carried with him the emotional scar tissue of his childhood as the son of an alcoholic father who had taken his family from one precarious situation to another. But as Ronald Reagan himself would later say, then along came Nancy Davis and saved my soul. At that point of of course, as I said, nobody could have imagined where his awakening interest in politics could have carried the two of them. 
And really only by looking back uh, can you begin to understand how crucial of a partner she really was in this endeavor, not just in getting him to the White House, but in the eight years they spent there and, and even the years beyond. She really exercised an influence unlike any first lady before or since. And as, as Christine was saying, as I wrote, it was really the power of intimacy. As affable as Ronald Reagan was, as gifted as he was at connecting with the country, he was really a remote figure. He was a loner who, who liked people, but he didn't really need them. He was close to exactly one person in the entire world, and he married her. Even Nancy would acknowledge there's a wall around him. He lets me get closer than anyone else, but there are times when even I feel that barrier. So it really fell to her to be the networker of the two of them. In the early years of his political career, she was really building the scaffolding of his rise. She was constantly on the phone with the wealthy benefactors who became known as the kitchen cabinet, stroking their egos and, and soliciting their opinions. As their son Ron told me, she cultivated them and maintained them in a way that my father wouldn't have, wouldn't have occurred to him really. But what was most important about Nancy Reagan as James Baker, who was their first White House chief of staff told me she really had the far superior radar of the two of them. She was shrewder about the people around him. She recognized that unless Ronald Reagan had the right set of people advising him that he could be led astray by his trusting nature and by his tendency to delegate. She was also capable of doing something that her conflict averse husband could not, which was getting rid of people who uh, did not put Ronald Reagan first. When, uh, when she was in the White House, she very rarely set foot in the West Wing. But if she was unhappy about something, everybody who worked there knew it. And um, when she decided somebody was not serving the president well, when somebody was in her disfavor, they tended not to last for very long in their jobs. She is one of the reasons, for example, that the Reagan White House went through a half dozen national security advisors but you really can see it all the way back to much earlier in his political career. When his uh, 1980 campaign was on the verge of imploding right around the New Hampshire profile, she was the uh, profile primary. She was really the one who engineered a badly needed shakeup in the campaign that included firing the campaign manager and his top lieutenants. Um, she was a pragmatist. Her ideology was simply what is good for Ronald Reagan. And she really mistrusted a lot of the more ideological advisors who surrounded him. She didn't like the type of people that she would describe as jump off the cliff with the flag flying conservatives. What James Baker, again, who was their first chief of staff, later Reagan's treasury secretary told me, she was the guardian. She had terrific political antenna, much better than his, in my view. Her instincts that time would show were usually right. Um, most crucially, and I think the chapter that in many ways is the heart of my book is the chapter about the Iran-Contra scandal which took place um, in Reagan's second term, really put him in very serious danger of being impeached. It was Nancy who remained clear-eyed enough to put together the rescue effort. She was relentless 
and ruthless in engineering the firing of Donald Reagan, their, the autocratic chief of staff in the second Reagan term. And this required a great deal of struggle with her own husband, who really, again, he, he was a great giver of second chances. He was somebody who didn't like conflict, but just as important, probably more important than, um, you know, demanding and ultimately getting a complete shakeup of how the White House operated. She also had to convince, had to push and push and push to convince her recalcitrant husband into acknowledging to the country and just as crucially to himself that he had made a massive blunder by trading arms to Iran in exchange for the release of American citizens who were being held hostage in the Middle East. I, I was really surprised in this book by how much I ended up writing about foreign policy. She was absolutely determined that her husband was going to go down in history as a figure of significance. And she really believed that ending the Cold War could be the accomplishment that secured Ronald Reagan's reputation among presidents. So she constantly was moving him in that direction. There was really a lot of skepticism among his more hawkish hardline advisors that there could ever be any such thing as a working relationship with Moscow, any such thing as an end to the Cold War. And the Reagans were a real married couple. They would quarrel over his hardline rhetoric, including his uh, description as the, of the Soviet Union as an evil empire. But I opened the book with a story that George Shultz, who was the Secretary of State for the second half of Ronald Reagan's first term and for his entire second term told me, Shultz, when I interviewed him was 97 years old. And he described a, a small dinner that ended up having just enormous importance. Washington was socked in a blizzard. It was one of the worst blizzards of the 20th century in February of 1983. George Schultz, still very new in his job, he'd only been doing it for about seven months, he really didn't know the Reagans all that well, had just barely beaten the blizzard coming in from a trip to China. So that weekend, Saturday afternoon, as the city is digging out, George Schultz gets a call from Nancy Reagan. And she says, why don't you and your wife come over to dinner tonight? It'll just be the four of us up in the family quarters. So Schultz shows up with his wife. He thinks they're having just sort of a social evening. And then all of a sudden, both of the Reagans start pounding him with questions about the Chinese. You know, what are they like as people? Do they have a sense of humor? Do they have a bottom line? And then the conversation moves on to the Soviet Union. Again, this is 1983. Um, and Ronald Reagan starts talking to Schultz about his own ideas for engaging America's superpower enemy. And Schultz begins to realize, as he told me, this man has never had a conversation with a big time communist leader and he is dying to have one. This was a surprise to Schultz. He, he only knew that Reagan had decades of hardline anti-communist rhetoric that his entire cabinet and national security council was, was populated by these hawkish cold warriors. Reagan at that point is presiding over the biggest military buildup in US history during peacetime. And Schultz suddenly realizes, you know, this man sees a real possibility for an opening with Moscow. At the same moment, he realizes that was the whole reason for that dinner. That was the whole reason that Nancy Reagan invited him over that night, that she wanted to get him alone with Ronald Reagan to see something about Reagan that really had the potential to 
change history. The other thing Schultz realized that evening was that he had an extremely valuable and important ally in a first lady who understood her husband like no one else did, who was, as I said, in fact, the only person in the world to whom Ronald Reagan was, was close. Um, her view on all of this was not rooted in geopolitical strategy. It was really, it was really her understanding of him and also her, her absolute determination that he make his place in history. As their secretary, as their secretary of defense, Caspar Weinberger said in one oral history that I came across, Nancy Reagan was more receptive to the idea of forming a working relationship with the Soviets than some of us were and more willing to trust them. She believed strongly in his negotiating capabilities. Again, not necessarily a role that you would associate with a first lady and especially with this first lady. Um, you know, I think that as the years have gone by, an appreciation has grown for the role that she played in assuring Ronald Reagan's success and elevating him to a figure who would continue to dominate politics for a generation after he was gone. And yet, though she was absolutely hyper vigilant in attending to his image and really almost always on the mark where his image was concerned, she was just often clueless about managing her own. He was called the Teflon president because nothing ever seemed to stick to him. If that was the case, she was the Velcro first lady. Um, she was an easy proxy, I think, for political opponents who were too intimidated by Ronald Reagan's popularity. Remember, this is a president who won re-election with 49 states voting for him. That they were too intimidated by his popularity, in some cases, to attack him directly. She also, she terrified for his safety after she almost lost him to an assassin's bullet two months into his presidency. She did some incredibly irrational things, including the consulting an astrologer to determine when and how he should make public appearances. She bought $200,000 worth of White House China with donated funds, not taxpayer money, but $200,000 set of China in the middle of the worst recession uh, that had hit the country since the Great Depression. Um, I think that a lot of the sort of things that are hard to understand about her character, you really do have to go back to the trauma of her own childhood. Um, she was the product of a bad match between an ambitious actress and a not very successful car salesman. Their marriage was effectively over by the time she was born and her mother essentially abandoned her for six years with relatives. So the earliest memories of her life and the ones that stuck with her were just yearning for this absent mother. Ultimately, her mother remarries a, a neurosurgeon in Chicago. He's a sort of stern, forbidding figure, but. Nancy Reagan adores Loyal Davis. He is probably, he is the mo second most important man ever to enter her life, but she was always sort of an outsider in her own home. And as her son, Ron and others, her stepbrother told me, it really sort of cast a shadow on her spirit, a sort of wariness, a sort of insecurity that never really lifted. And she always had this sense that no matter how good things seemed to be going, the bottom could drop out at any moment. And certainly that seems to be confirmed two months into her husband's presidency when 
he is almost killed by a would-be assassin. Finally, it is confirmed very shortly after he leaves the White House when he is incapacitated by Alzheimer's and he is off on a long journey where she cannot follow him. The other thing about the Reagans is the dynamics within the Reagan family. And I write quite a bit about that in the book. They were a blended family. There were two children from his first marriage to Jane Wyman, two children that they had together. They, their bond was in many ways so close that it really didn't make room for anyone else. And each of the children suffered in sort of his or her own way as they were kind of making it on their own. Nancy Reagan herself would write, all I ever wanted to be was a good wife and a good mother. And I guess I was more successful at one than the other. Um, the final sad chapter of their lives together, as I said, would bring yet another reassessment of her. Even her most cynical critics were just moved by the stoicism and the devotion that she showed her husband in the final decade of his life. She also became the shaper and the guardian of his legacy, which culminated in her drive to publish his handwritten presidential diaries, his handwritten correspondence of half a century. She, she knew that only in Ronald Reagan's own hand could he ever dispel the belief among especially liberal intellectuals that these, you know, he was in Clark Clifford's word, an amiable dunce. Um, and, you know, I think that the publication of a lot of this stuff really has also forced a reassessment of Reagan. So as I said, and I'd love to open it up to questions. I mean, she did, she, she for the acclaim and the sympathy that she finally got, she did pay the highest price imaginable. And ultimately she was left as she had always feared to write the final chapter alone. So, so Christine, do you, do you wanna open it up or how do you wanna do this? Uh, yes, um, thank you so much, Nancy, for the wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, I know everyone enjoyed it. And if you have questions, would you please put them in chat and I will ask the questions um, to Karen. Um, so think about your questions and put them in the chat. Um, I think it's fascinating to know, um, Nancy had a difficult childhood until her mother remarried, but how did um, her, her education or her um, second father who was a surgeon that was at, um, obviously well educated himself. How did she learn how these skills and how did she learn how to manipulate people so well and have such insight? Uh, maybe the words not manipulate, but have insight into um, people's characters and what she should do. Yeah, I really do think it was a survival skill for her in her childhood, but also her mother. Um, in some ways, her stepbrother, again, he was well into his 90s when I interviewed him, but he said you can really look at the pattern of her mother's Edith Davis's marriage to Loyal Davis and see the pattern of the Reagan's own marriage, that while Loyal Davis was a brilliant neurosurgeon, if you can even imagine somebody who in the 1920s was practicing in the field of neurosurgery, what a pioneer he was, but it was really Edith his actress wife who engineered their rise into Chicago society. As Nancy was growing up, um, her, her life was full of all these famous people uh, who her mother had gotten to know in show business. Spencer Tracy was a fixture in their apartment. Uh, ultimately, it is Spencer Tracy who engineers Nancy Davis's screen test at 
MGM in Hollywood. So it, it sets it up so she can't possibly fail. I think the single, uh, my favorite little tiny, tiny tidbit of trivia that I found as I was researching the book was that when MGM decided in 1949 to give a contract to this not terribly accomplished actress, Nancy Davis, that is one of the reasons they turned down Marilyn Monroe. So that was probably the worst decision ever made by MGM Studios. Um, she, Loyal Davis did insist that she get an education. She graduated from Smith College. Um, she was um, it, uh, just a few years ahead of Barbara Bush who dropped out of Smith College. And by the way, the, uh, the complete, uh, the rivalry between Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush and their utter, utter dislike and contempt for each other is also becomes one of the sort of running storylines in my book. Wow. So you talked about um, how important the Iran um, incident was and the rescue effort. Did you talk to any of the hostages um, in your book? No, because it was um, what I really wrote about was the kind of engineering of what was going on within because the hostages were actually released. Uh, they were released right. as Ronald Reagan was being sworn into office. That was sort of the last act of the government of Iran to get back at Jimmy Carter. And when it is later found that Reagan is getting you know, that those were the Iran hostages, but then, you know, there are other hostages being taken one at a time uh, in Beirut. And, you know, ultimately, like I said, I really focused on what she was doing in the White House to save her husband's presidency. And mind you, laws had been broken. Money from these arms sales had been diverted to the Contras who were fighting to overthrow the socialist government in Nicaragua, in total, totally breaking US law. I mean, people were in danger of going to, some people did get convicted in this. So, um, you know, she is sort of flying blind in this because nobody really knows who in the West Wing was involved in this plot. Ultimately, when Reagan finally gives the nationally televised address that quite literally saved his presidency, she won't trust anybody in the West Wing to write it. At that point, the communication shop is being headed by Pat Buchanan. So she actually goes out and recruits her own outside speechwriter to do it because she just was not going to trust anybody on the West Wing who, again, she didn't even know who had been involved doing what. Whoa. Boy, you've done lots and lots of research on this. And so did you go out to the um, Ronald Reagan Presidential um, Library here um, in California and do a lot of research there? Were they helpful to you? I spent weeks and weeks and weeks in the research room of that library. I don't know how many of you have been there. It's on this beautiful mesa in Simi Valley. The research room has no windows and I'm convinced it's 60 degrees all the time in there. Um, I went through, the, one thing I learned that I found was fascinating was that in presidential libraries, there are the things they have to show you and the things they don't have to show you. And basically, somebody from the National Archives goes through all of a president's papers and decides, you know, this should be, this is part of his official business, this should be in the, in the public domain. But there's a whole other set of documents, the private stuff, the personal stuff that is really under, usually under the control of a foundation, in this case, the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. Um, and it is really just sort of a process that for me took literally years and years of negotiating to get my hands on some of that stuff. I found, um, letters that had been written as early as 1911 by Reagan's mother in pencil. That's 1911, the year he was born. I found a, there was a diary from uh, Nancy Reagan's mother's, she was aboard a ship going to England when she met 
the man who would become Nancy Reagan's adoptive father. There's a diary of that. Um, one of the more extraordinary things I came across that I think had never been seen before was a letter that Ronald Reagan wrote while he was in the White House in 1982 to his dying father-in-law who is literally on his deathbed. He would die within three weeks, Loyal Davis. Nancy Reagan's, the only man she ever considered her father, Loyal Davis, um, was an atheist. And Ronald Reagan, as president of the United States, sits down and writes four handwritten pages begging his father-in-law to accept God before he died. And um, I, I really found in those four pages the sort of clearest distillation of Ronald Reagan's own religious faith. But then I had to go back to the foundation and say, look, you know, I, I think this is important. I think it shouldn't wait for the book. I would really like to write about this for the Washington Post. And again, those are the kinds of things you just really, I mean, the library wasn't even aware the letter was there, much less that they wanted to, to give it to me. But uh, ultimately, I was able to get, get them to let me write it. Well, it shows how important your research was and what insight you had um, prior to preparing this biography and what it made for everyone to understand Ronald Reagan better. So Nancy had um, a, a lot of friendships, did she? Did she have friendships with um, females? Or uh, she, really she, guard herself closely? Uh, she did. And, um, but then she had a lot of, it, it's interesting, I found that most of her relationships with the other first ladies were not so great. Um, and at one point during the 1976 Republican convention where Ronald Reagan almost takes the Republican nomination away from a sitting Republican president, you know, Nancy always suffered by the comparison with kind of breezy, modern Betty Ford. And at one point during that convention, Betty Ford says, oh, poor Nancy, she was a career girl before she got married, but then she met Ronnie and she just fell apart. So there, there was a lot of, you know, in a lot of cases, these women, their husbands had been rivals. So sometimes I think it's easier for the principals to set these things aside than it is for often for, for the spouses. She had a lot of good, for her closest friends were all in Los Angeles. Um, and it was a, generally a pretty wealthy set of people. But I also found instances where she could be, I mean, and again, a lot of people found her incredibly difficult to deal with, but she could also be very, very kind to people in need. And one of the people I interviewed for this book was John McCain's first wife, Carol, who in around 1980, she, she was the wife who had waited for him for the five years he was a prisoner of war. As what happened to a lot of these POW families, the marriage frayed after he got back. And finally, John McCain meets somebody he falls in love with, Cindy McCain, and tells Carol he's out of the marriage. Nancy Reagan, who had gotten to know the McCains uh, from the time he had gotten back, she was very interested and involved in the POW cause, takes Carol McCain under her wing. The next thing I see in the records is that Carol McCain is traveling with Nancy Reagan on the plane all the way through the 1980 campaign. And ultimately, gets a really great job in the Reagan White House uh, managing the, the visitor's office. And Carol McCain did tell me that, you know, really Nancy Reagan just sort of swooped in, knew the kind of distress she was in and, you know, couldn't fix it, but she was just trying to make it as easy as possible. Well, thank you for that. So someone else wants to know about, can you speak a little bit about her role um, uh, related to the AIDS crisis and also uh, to Hollywood friends. And those are two separate questions. You know, I, I have an entire chapter on the AIDS epidemic in the book. And I found a lot of new and quite frankly, 
mostly horrifying information about what was going on inside the White House. Um, the AIDS epidemic is something that is always going to stand as I think one of the deepest scars on Ronald Reagan's legacy and on his presidency. He didn't even say the name of the disease until publicly until his second term. Um, but I, I have found a lot of evidence, and again, I lay it out in the book, Nancy Reagan being the daughter of a physician. Her son, Ron, is up in New York dancing with the Joffrey Ballet. He's part of the arts community up there. He's telling her about what is going on. And she really does try to, again, belatedly, not aggressively enough, but she does sort of try to get Ronald Reagan into a spot where he can begin to think about this disease sort of more abstractly um, and understand how bad it is. When he finally decides to give his first speech on the subject, once again, she goes out to get a outside speechwriter to write it because she does not trust anybody in the West Wing to handle this because in a, the Reagan administration, there were a lot of people who thought the AIDS epidemic wasn't a health crisis, it was a moral crisis. And it's also when Reagan finally appoints, and again, belatedly, a high powered commission to take a look at how he's handled the AIDS epidemic and come up with recommendations. It became known as the Watkins Commission. It was Nancy Reagan who insisted that there be at least one openly gay expert appointed to that commission. And it was, believe it or not, quite controversial at the time among conservatives. Um, people like Gary Bauer, who was a domestic policy advisor to Reagan, or Gordon Humphrey, a conservative senator from New Hampshire, were horrified that somebody should be appointed to a commission who was gay. Uh, Gordon Humphrey says, you know, this should not be an administration that appoints people based on their bedroom habits. I mean, those were, that is how people were still talking about the AIDS epidemic, even as late as 1987, when it is killing tens of thousands of people. Thank you for that insight. And you have a whole chapter in your book. I would recommend everyone to read that chapter for more insight. So talking about her husband's Alzheimer's, did she support the use of stem cell therapy um, when her husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's? Uh, not when he was diagnosed. The, really, the, the technology around it uh, isn't really developing until after, you know, around two, there was a big, big controversy early in George W. Bush's administration uh, over whether they would continue to allow federal involvement in stem cell research. By now, it is too late that, for it to ever help Ronald Reagan. But Nancy Reagan becomes a very big believer in stem cell research. She first lobbies kind of behind the scenes and ultimately she stands up as, as George W. Bush in 2004 is about to make a very big set of decisions on stem cell research. He's already disappointed her once she gets up and publicly announces that she is in favor of stem cell research. Now, of course, this is quite controversial among conservatives because stem cell research involves the destruction of human embryos. And uh, Michael Deaver, who was Nancy Reagan's closest advisor, talks about how some Republican on Capitol Hill after Nancy makes this announcement calls up Michael Deaver and says, Ronald Reagan would never have supported this, to which Michael Deaver replies, well, Ronald Reagan hasn't had to take care of Ronald Reagan for the last 10 years. Whoa. So um, you did talk about Nancy uh, Reagan and Barbara Bush detested each other, but we really didn't know about that. Was that kind of protected? at that particular time, obviously it was by journalists 
And was that really more what they wanted to do at that time to protect the first ladies? Um, I don't think that journalists were, I mean, they knew there was some tension, but uh, not to the degree we know about it now. One of the things, uh, that these the two of them would just sort of go at each other. And probably the most glittering sought after social event of the entire eight years of the Reagan presidency was when Prince Charles and Princess Diana come to the White House for a big official dinner. You, you might remember the evening because Princess Diana actually dances with John Travolta uh, that evening. Nancy refused to invite the vice president and his wife to, to this event. Um, she, you know, they were rarely invited to the residents uh, in the White House. It was interesting when Joe Biden recently said that he had never set foot in the White House family quarters while Obama was there. People were really shocked. But, um, you know, the Bushes were almost never invited there. Um, there's another episode in my book, though, where, I mean, Barbara Bush could dish it out as well as take it. And um, as her husband's beginning to run for president in his own right in 1987, 88, there is a flight of Air Force Two to New Hampshire for him to campaign. And Barbara Bush comes back to the back of the plane, which is where the reporters all sit. And she starts doing these just incredibly harsh imitations of Nancy Reagan for the reporters. And finally, Lou Cannon, who was covering the trip for the Washington Post says to her, he says, you know, Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Reagan has spies everywhere. She's gonna hear about this to which Barbara Bush turns around and says, I know, so. Oh, it's like she almost wanted her. She her absolutely know. wanted yeah, her. Wanted her to know. Um, so based on your extensive experience from writing this, very um, detailed and researched book. Have you drawn any conclusions about the ideal time to write a biography of a famous um, person? Do you write it while they're alive or do you write it when they are deceased? You know, in, in this case, um, I there were a lot of people who were willing to talk to me about things that I think they might have been reluctant to talk about when the Reagans were alive. Um, again, it's, it's she in particular is just an incredibly complicated person. Um, and I am so grateful that people like James Baker, George Schultz, um, Stu Spencer, who was uh, Ronald Reagan's first campaign manager and probably his closest political advisor for his entire life, uh, lives out in the desert in California. I spent many, many hours with him. And I think in some cases, Secret Service agents, it, it was in some cases, I think um, people were ready to tell some of these stories because they realized that if they don't tell them now, they're, they're never going to get told. Um, and so I was just so grateful. And again, it was in some cases, it was two or three years of talking to people and they would sort of gradually open up. Just about everything in this book is on the record. Um, I have very few bits of information that I felt that I had to you know, not be completely transparent about the sourcing. And that includes a lot of information too about the tensions and the within the Reagan family, which I think are probably the most painful part of the book. Well, you can tell by your research how much um, information you have and how detailed everything is and how you relied on the facts. So somebody wanted to know, if Nancy Reagan was alive today, do you think she would want to be president or vice president or have more political ambitions other than just supporting her husband? You know, I've got to tell you, it's so interesting to me because this was a woman who was so comfortable with her own power and so completely fearless about wielding that power. And yet, um, 
if you were to ask her if she were a feminist, she would probably for most of her life have said no. Um, I'm I'm just a wife. Um, and she it, that to me was also part of the tension of the book. Um, because she is they are entering public life, they are entering politics at a moment of great upheaval in society that, you know, it's the Vietnam protests, but it's also the rise of the burgeoning feminist movement. And so many of the harshest stories that were written about Nancy Reagan were written about young, were written by younger women journalists. And as her, as Nancy Reagan's good friend, Catherine Graham, the owner of the Washington Post told her, yeah, it's because you represent everything they're rebelling against. But it was also interesting to see after Iran-Contra, when it becomes clear, you know, she has just mowed down the White House chief of staff, all of a sudden, a lot of these the critics of hers, especially, you know, younger women feminist writers are going, wait a minute, you know, she was able to come through for her husband when all the smart guys around him didn't. They weren't up to the job. And also, a lot of the conservative men who sort of like their first ladies a little more traditional than this uh, are suddenly turning on her. Uh, William Sapphire in the New York Times writes that she is an incipient Edith Wilson running the country in her husband's stead. Um, and it was either him or Scotty Reston, I'm forgetting which, but one or the other of them actually used the word henpecked in a column to describe Ronald Reagan. So all of a sudden, you know, the, these male writers who were really much more comfortable with a traditional first lady were not really that <laughs> feeling that way about a powerful one. Wow, so you have such insight into Nancy Reagan with so many um, years of research, original um, research um, into her papers and papers at the library. So do you have another book um, in planned? Are you going to be researching another first lady? Well, I, I you know, I don't know. I, I um, you know, I've been really gratified by the reviews and especially my book editor and my agent have been very gratified by the reviews. Um, I would want somebody, if it's a biography, I would really want somebody as sort of complex and who had as many layers as she did. And also I do think there's a value in sort of reintroducing people to somebody they think they know. They aren't necessarily sure they like, but they think they know. So I, I suppose I will at some point look for another subject, but right now I still feel like I'm in the labor and delivery room with baby number one. Well, you have quite a wonderful book and um, this book that you have just published, um, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. And I thank you very much, um, Karen, for presenting and participating with us today to share your book. It's absolutely fabulous. The four years of research plus all of your knowledge about all of the individuals associated with the Reagan presidency um, is spectacular. And I encourage everyone to, if you haven't had a time, chance to check out the book, please check out the book from the Pasadena Public Library. You can see how thick it is. The information in it is quite wonderful. And um, Karen has talked about some of the special chapters in the book um, and the wonderful index and the notes for each of the chapters is extensive. So. I thank you so much for coming today and agreeing to speak for us. And I thank the Friends of the Pasadena Public Library for sponsoring you for us today. And thank you so much, Karen, for your time and efforts for us today. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Christina. And good luck with getting the library back on back open and, and uh, structurally where it needs to be. Thank you very much. I know everyone joins us in Pasadena with those same sentiments. Thank you very much. Let's give Karen a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming.